Hey, pals, just want to say thanks to our listeners for supporting independent podcasters like your Go With The Heat hosts. You make this show possible every week by hanging out with us, and we love you for it. If you'd like to show some additional support, head on over to patreon.com slash go with the heat to find out more. Hello, and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 5, Episode 50. Every week, I'm going to do that. I'm gonna add that little inflection. Like, eh, we only got six more after this. Six more, and the show is over. As I shed a tear. <laughs> this episode is titled Over the Line. It originally premiered on April 28th, 1989. Now, hold on. That's a big gap from the last time an episode aired on Miami Vice. The last episode was March 17th, 1989. And apparently, it was delayed for some series called The Dream Street, which I've never heard of before. So, Melissa. Can you help us out here? What is this Dream Street show that held up the next episode of Miami Vice? It was, as far as I remember, it was, this is going to sound really funny. It was like a drama about 20, 20 something people, and they were they lived in Hobo, Hoboken, New Jersey. You know way too much about that because that's actually what I read about it. <laughs> <laughs> you so that out of memory. <laughs> I, I only remember it was it was not it was not good. I only saw like one episode. So, so it was like some kind of party of five on the Jersey Shore. I only remember it was it, that it was like distinctively. I remember it was in New Jersey, and it was like a drama about people like white people in New Jersey. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> No wonder no one wanted to watch it. <laughs> I remember it not being good. There's not enough tanning beds. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> when I looked it up, I didn't find any information about the show except for like the little Wikipedia entry. I did, however, find a 1999 boy band called Dream Street performing on the Maury show. I remember them. They were young, <laughs> right? Are they, or weren't they like really young? Yes. And I have a question. Do you think they found out who their real dad was? Because they were on Maury. So <laughs> Either that Maury. or they took a lie detector. <laughs> Which one of them was a liar? <laughs> the writer for this episode is Robert Ward. She sound familiar. He's got eight writing credits and is also the show's co-producer. And is also written by Scott Shepard, who also wrote Redemption in Blood, Bad Timing, Hard Knocks, and will write Freefall. Hmm. 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 The director is Russ Mayberry, who will direct Freefall. Hmm. hmm. He's also probably the most accomplished TV director Vice has ever had. He is a titan behind the camera. He's got an unreal list of directing credits for TV. Before I get started, get chickens, you'll go on each other's lives. Pals, just want to remind you, check out that Patreon, patreon.com slash go with the heat. If you would love to get some stickers, now is your chance. With only six episodes left to go with this podcast, this is probably the only time we're going to be doing a merch run. And these stickers are probably all that there's ever going to be. We have five amazing stickers, including a quote card from Melissa, which is just fabulous, talking about Jamaican tubs. <laughs> you got to get in on it. All you have to do, go to patreon.com slash go with the heat, pledge $1. That's it. $1. On February 1st, Patreon will run your car. They'll give us that $1, and then we will send you those stickers. That's it. For $1, you get them. I'd be happy to send them out to anyone who just pledges $1. We're not even making any money on it. Just... Pledge one dollar. We'll send it out. This is the best way to be able to get them out to people. So just go there and pledge one dollar. If you want to give us more money, I mean, we'll take it. You want to give us a million dollars? We'll take a million. I mean, <laughs> whatever you want to do. I'm, I can't tell you what to do with your money. I can tell you there's a pledge level where if you match that, we will send you a fake mustache, a business card, and, and a skinny, skinny tie. tie. And you will be our Castillo. So just go check out that Patreon, patreon.com slash go with the heat. Let's get on and talk about this episode. And my favorite part of this episode is that we actually get an Izzy speaking part, not just mentioning Izzy, Izzy speaking. We get an Izzy episode. And guys, just recently, I actually ran across an article mentioning Martin Ferreira, who plays Izzy, and was talking about one of his roles after Vice. As you know, Izzy plays the lawyer that gets eaten at the beginning of Jurassic Park, the original Jurassic Park movie, which is one of the greatest scenes <laughs> uh, ever, in my opinion. Him <laughs> sitting on the toilet and getting <laughs> eaten by the T-Rex. It's one of the most random scenes in a Spielberg movie. I guess him and Jeff Goldblum met early in filming. They were filming in Hawaii. And Izzy or Martin, Jeff Goldblum about going to Steven Spielberg and talking about switching parts where basically Jeff Goldblum's character is the one that gets eaten on the toilet. 
<laughs> and Martin Ferrero's lawyer, it just breaks his leg. He would have gotten a much bigger part had he been <laughs> able to talk uh, Jeff Goldblum into this. Obviously, Jeff was like, uh, yeah, I'm not sure about that. And it didn't happen. But made me wonder, guys. Is Martin Ferrero, is he actually Izzy? Because remember, earlier in like our season two recap, we did a deep dive into Martin where I had read some stuff, quotes from his social media account. I'm starting to think Martin is actually Izzy. I think he absorbed him into his persona and that's just the way that he is. And I love the fact that the greatest living actor tells Jeff um, Goldblum. Goldblum, I have this idea. We should go to him together and you should tell Spielberg. Don't you want to die. <laughs> you want to do this. <laughs> yes. If you want to read the article, it'll be on the website too for this episode. So you'll be able to go actually read it. It's fantastic. The best part, like I was saying, is that he goes to Spielberg and is like, you should tell him yeah, the, the Mr. Him oh, yeah. <laughs> nominated for Academy yeah, yeah. Awards. <laughs> Also, I have some reptile gel that I'd like to sell you. <laughs> reptile gel. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, speaking of the reptile gel, let's get over and talk about this week's episode because we only have two, technically two episodes until Freefall aired on NBC. But reminder, that's not the order that we're watching these episodes in. We will watch the lost episodes before Freefall. But this one, this one has a gigantic lead right into Freefall. So let's go break this one down. When we open up, we're at a steakhouse on a very rundown side of town. This is a side of Miami we haven't seen before. Normally, we see like the downtown district that's really run down, but I think it underwent the revitalization project while the show was filming, so it may not exist anymore. Yeah, this one's really bad. <laughs> yeah, but it's the same, same thing, just a different day, different part of Miami. Of course, lazy dope dealers are always late. Sonny even complains that the Ding Dong better show up soon because he's getting hungry. I love when he says things like Ding Dong and Bozo. <laughs> <laughs> shows he's really from Florida. <laughs> <laughs> the Mark Bonnie shows up and Sonny calls him fat, which is interesting. He's not fat, by the like, way. Uh, no, he's not. I mean, he's hairy. No. He's got yeah, that I mean, he's hairy, but he's <laughs> fat. <laughs> And there is something else that would gigantically stand out about him being that he is bald with a ponytail. Like Yes, exactly. <laughs> He's got, yeah. Tommy's the guy's name. And now Sonny says, let's play our favorite game, Turn Him and Burn Him. Because what they're hoping is that they're going to capture Tommy T here. And he's going to give up who his contact is that he's getting the drugs from inside. And always, always important. They're not going to wait for backup. He says, we wait for backup, and then we go in. But he doesn't wait for backup. He just goes. Yeah, he just goes. He's like, yeah, when backup gets here, we'll go in. And they just go in. <laughs> Inside, a couple of the ugliest people who have ever lived are <laughs> making this deal. Tommy T and Mano. <laughs> Why is Mano not wearing a shirt? I don't know. This is a very casual deal <laughs> going on here. Why did they bring their girlfriend? Is this like a double date? I don't know. Mano acts weird the whole entire time. He's like, so what are we doing? <laughs> 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 Can I have some of that? <laughs> Outside, the deal starts stalking around and getting position, And then a very nice ice cream truck comes pulling up. <laughs> and his name's Dr. Dingy, who that's what I'm going to call him for the rest of the episode. He is forever dr dingy says the cops are on their <laughs> way he's got a real catchy song that goes along with it. i can't actually sing it back but he's got oh, a real yeah. catchy song oh my god I, I literally laughed out loud because he, he's he's driving down the street in an ice cream truck and he just breaks out into a poem about how the police <laughs> are outside it, it is the greatest way to ruin a bus and obviously ends with everyone running away yeah, they're not able to catch any tubs jump on top of Mr. Dingy's ice cream truck, or Dr. Dingy, sorry, <laughs> he went to four years of me medical ice cream school, not to be called exactly. Mr. Dingy. Also, you, <laughs> yes. close call there. You just think we're going to say he just jumped on Dr. Dingy <laughs> and not add the ice cream truck part. <laughs> But Dr. Dingy is able to get away. Tubbs can't hold on. And then at the end, Sonny comes running up and picks up Tubbs off the ground. And Tubbs is like, I didn't even get a chance to order ice cream. <laughs> Zing! <laughs> I feel like the motivation of a fudge stickle would have worked for Stan. <laughs> like if Stan was there, he would have caught him. One of those Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle ice creams with the gum, with the bubblegum eyes. Tweety Birds. The Tweety oh, Birds with the, the bubblegum eyes. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> 
So I'm going to stop here for a second because this is going to set the whole tone for me for the rest of the episode is that this episode felt like a season two episode. Yes, it did. We opened up. It's very serious. They're going to do this bust. There's a big time drug deal that's happening. Ma- Mono says to Tommy that he's got bigger things that are going on. He he's wants to get this deal done, but there's other bigger things that are happening. Also, as we find out later, this might be a deal for their little vigilante group and not actually a sale for Reggie. Who we're going to meet later. This may have just been a fundraising mm-hmm. deal for, for them. But then also, it was funny. There was moments where the show didn't take itself so seriously, which is when this is classic Vice. This yeah. is like as, as good as the show ever mm-hmm. was. And I just want to ask you guys real quick. Do you think, had they waited for backup, do you think they would have caught at least the ice cream man, if not both people? I think they would have caught people. <laughs> they would have caught them all, right? Yeah. Because the mm-hmm. car barely gets away from Sunny, and then the ice cream truck barely gets away from Tubbs. If they had... Yeah, Police so out there, Dr. Dingy episode, wouldn't even be able to drive down the road. Yeah, episode over. <laughs> I'm a little disappointed that Tubbs couldn't take Dr. Dingy. Just saying. <laughs> it's an ice cream truck. You can't even hold on to it, Tubbs. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen four-year-olds hang on better than Exactly. <laughs> and then we go to the opening credits. Before we move on, this is our chance to check in with this week's guest stars. John, we're getting to the end of not only season five, but the end of the show. But just got to be getting thin. <laughs> So I'm not holding my breath for what we got for guest stars this week. Yeah, unfortunately, like they're experiencing at the precinct in Vice, the show is also experiencing budget cuts, apparently. No real high-profile guest stars. We've got one guy that stands out. So real quick, I want to give a shout-out to Kevin Quigley, who plays the geek in this episode, because he also played Willie in Baseballs of Death. Oh, another, so, another return guests are <laughs> another return if you had to pick one tomas arana is definitely the big guest star in the episode born in auburn grew up in san francisco and then after college moved to new york while doing off-broadway shows and getting into acting he would leave new york hitchhike through europe settle in naples and work at this famous art gallery where he would work with, literally work with artists like Andy Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol actually painted him. He owns that portrait. He became like a super successful actor. He's just not a big name. In Europe, he starred in over like 30 films. Even in, in American films, he's been in some really big movies. He was in The Hunt for Red October. Bodyguard, he played the would-be killer. Mm. He was in Tombstone. He was in L.A. Confidential, Gladiator, The Bourne Supremacy, The Dark Knight Rises. He was even in Guardians of the Galaxy as one of the Kree ambassadors. Damn. The last point that I'll drive home that I believe he is a legitimate star is like when you look through his... Now, most of his TV credits are just an episode here, an episode there. But he was also in an episode of Crossing Jordan. (laughs) He's big time. Swish. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. So now that we got the big one out of the way, let's talk about Robert Fields, who plays Captain Richard Highsmith. Now, he's just a measly little captain in this episode. As we noticed in the open, a lot of things in common with the episode upcoming Freefall, in which he will reappear as police chief Highsmith in, the epi- in that episode. Spoiler alert, he's going to win. <laughs> <laughs> also, so have to piece together like how this episode ends and that this actor reappears as police chief and that also the writer and the director are coming back for free fall. There's a, there's a lot of stuff falling into place here. Robert Fields, his first role ever was opposite Steve McQueen in the 1950 horror sci-fi classic The Blob. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, that is him. That's him. See? I, I, I knew him once I read the first one. You would recognize, like, if you've seen the 58 Blob. So, and I guess he was buddies with Steve McQueen. His resume beyond that, not as impressive, but still some very some very interesting movies. He the played a character him. named... Dr- yeah, he played a character named Joel in the 1969 film, They Shoot Horses, Don't They? Asshole. He was also in the 65 movie, Frankenstein Meets the Space Monster. Well, that sounds like a gem. <laughs> he, he, was in the, he was in the original 75 Stepford Wives, so I'll give him that. But he was also in, in 77, he was in a movie called Looking for Mr. Good Bar, which I can only imagine is about a candy bar. I just immediately went to the episode of The Simpsons where they get the Venus coming to Milo. 
And when they first walk onto the floor of the Candy Expo, there's a page from Mr. Goodbar. Deep, deep yeah. cut. Email the show, go with you at gmail.com if you got that joke. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Probably his most notable role outside Blob is playing Daniel in the 1987 movie Anna. That's a movie. It is. I don't know. It's Wikipedia. I thought it was big. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever wrote that likes the movie. <laughs> I'm going to start doing that. Like he's best known for his role in and then find the most obscure movie. This is, this is what he's most known for. Go in there and change like Malcolm McDowell's Wikipedia page to not be like a Clockwork Orange. It'd be like some yes. random Basketball. Movie. <laughs> yeah. Random movie. Okay, and that brings us to our last star in the episode. Our next guest star is Anthony Burreal, who plays Johnny. And he is both a film and stage actor, writer, and a musician. Let's start off with something that you guys might know him from. He played Vinny in the 1985 horror flick Friday the 13th, number five, A New (laughs) Beginning. Dang, we only went to four. (laughs) We missed five. (laughs) Okay, okay. So he's also in the very underrated 1987 Vietnam War flick Hamburger Hill. Oh, mm-hmm. that's a good movie. Mm-hmm. That is a good one. Yeah. So other than that, I mean, guy did a ton of Broadway shows, and, uh, including some real famous ones. He's like a, he's a very prominent New Yorker, I guess. One of his shows was the Tony Award winning Who's Tommy, which I guess was huge in New York at some point. Mm. He's also very close friends with Ben Stiller, which is maybe how he got the role, seeing as we've already met, seen Ben Stiller in, in guest stars previously. Oh, that's true. He also appeared in Paula Abdul's video for her song Rush Rush. Now we're talking. Now we're talking. That's a good song. <laughs> Does that one also have an animated cat? Mm-hmm. No. Oh. That's the one where it's at the uh, planetarium in Los Angeles. Do you not know that one? If it's not an animated cat in a Paula Abdul, I'm not watching. <laughs> oh, my God. What are you, dad? <laughs> I'm only here for the animated cat. <laughs> yeah. So some other movies that you might know him from. He was in 90s blockbuster Girlfriend from Hell. That's a thing. <laughs> the huge TV movie Sinatra in 92. And the very popular Kiss Me Guido in 97. <laughs> <laughs> and something called Gooch in 03. <laughs> Literally spelled C-H-O-C-H. Chooch. <laughs> And then, of course, your standard TV appearances in Law & Order and Law & Order SVU. When we come back from the opening credits, we're at this hotel, like a restaurant inside of a hotel, and Castillo is meeting with Richard Highsmith, I'm just going to call him Dicky for the rest of the episode, who says that the Vice Department is fat. It's got too much. It's spending too much money. It's got too many people. I mean, I think you could point, if the, if the budget is too high, you could probably point it all at one man. <laughs> but I mean, I mean not really. <laughs> no more money, not going to increase the budget. That'll increase the motivation of the police officers on the force. He does not know Sonny, does he? Oh, man. <laughs> and his pitch gets even better because not only does he say, like, so we're going to cut all of your, your, your budget. Also, all you guys need to go out and write a speeding ticket for every now and then. No one works behind a desk anymore. No desk jobs. So that means, John, our dream might come true. Trudy might become a real police officer. They'll let her out of the office and let her go <laughs> do stuff. Yay! Hey, she was in this one. She got to take some guys to a room <laughs> for later on and hold them there at the end. Cassio really doesn't care what Dickie's trying to sell here either. He says, we're at war and we need money, not PR. And Dickie is not happy about that. Mm-mm. No, and that takes us into now... We jump to the next scene where Castillo's relaying all this info to the Vice Squad. And guys, immediately in the beginning of the episode, I was immediately distracted by the gigantic Goldberg Steve Austin looking dude with a cigar. (laughs) When did he join the force and how come we haven't seen him in an episode? That was like they pulled people out of the woodwork. It was like, none of these people have ever been in this building before. Also, why were there so many people there at that meeting? There's not that many people that work there. I didn't didn't realize their unit was that big. Like, where did all these people come from? How come they can't help out as backup on the Mr. Dingy or Dr. Dingy bust? I'm starting to think that he's got a a point about these these people just getting too much money to work there. Those people don't do squat. (laughs) In the station. Down from behind your desk. Want Steve Austin or arrest someone? <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
they were reviewing the case, but it really devolves into that argument, between, especially between Sonny and Castillo. Now, Castillo's not necessarily arguing with Sonny. He sees his point that they're barely making it work as it is, and having more budget cuts isn't going to make things any better. But Castillo says, you got a job to do, so go do it. I mean, you know, yeah. Sonny could give up his yacht he lives on. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Like, Sonny's sitting there grandstanding and talking tough, but pretty tough for a rich guy. I mean, you got to go home to your yacht and your mansion. <laughs> yeah, Tubbs has got to go sleep in his car. <laughs> he doesn't even have a place to live. <laughs> I mean, Stan's got a gambling problem. Yeah, and he's got a crappy apartment, too. See that shirt he was wearing with all the numbers on it? He didn't even know. <laughs> <laughs> his wardrobe has gone downhill since he started gambling. <laughs> So Sunny storms out and him and Tubbs go to see Izzy. Now, Izzy, we haven't seen you in forever. And you were just always so happy to see. Don't change, Izzy. <laughs> you're finding ways to keep the money flowing. And in this case, you're trying to sell at like a McDonald's play structure. Maybe <laughs> that's what? what it is where all these old people are hanging out. But why was she suntanning at the McDonald's play structure? Why was there <laughs> this like weird concrete shapes that they were on top that's of? Old and people. Stuff like that. He's okay. an old people holder. <laughs> <laughs> and he's trying to sell them. I don't them. know, but there's so much amazing with this with this scene. I mean, he starts out telling her he's going to rescue her uh, with his amazing reptile gel aging uh, cream. It's been around for 5,000 years. He sells her by telling her, have you, have you ever seen a sunburnt snake? <laughs> um, and then even when uh, Tubbs and Crockett approach and try and cock block his deal, he's like, they're silent partners from Tampa. And then when they pull him away, they're asking what it is, certain reptile fluids. Like, there's so much to unpack here. <laughs> what reptile fluids are we talking about? Semen. Where is he getting these reptiles? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone knows all the nutrients is in the reptile semen. <laughs> is, is this the pitch that he used on Goldblum? Yes. <laughs> Trust me. This is what I'm talking about. Season two vice. You have mm -hmm. this little interlude of something funny happening before something serious happens, right? That was the theme that we did in season two and three. Yeah. That was something that we always pointed out. Mm -hmm. Here's something silly that happened. Now it's time for something serious. Is he being silly? We're going to go to serious. And what's happening here is that the duo want to know who is Dr. Dinky. And Izzy says, I don't know. I can tell you that there's this other guy named Reginald Hawkins. And he also works with Dr. Dinky. But no one knows who Dr. Dinky is. Mm -hmm. He's just this thing on the street. By the way, to recap, we have the T-Man, Dr. Dinky. And now Reginald, which we are looking for. <laughs> Reginald sounds like that's too regal to be into drugs and <laughs> the underbelly. Well, Tubbs recognized him. Says, oh, that's someone from New York. Oh, I have questions, though, because when we run into Reginald, Reginald looks awfully young. <laughs> Tubbs does not. <laughs> so, <laughs> how did yeah, he run into Yeah, when was the last time circles? he was working robbery in New York? Like 10 years ago? Yeah, so I'm saying, like, he, how, how long he's been here for at least five years, right? Five years ago, that guy would have been like 18 or something. <laughs> he's young. <laughs> so Reginald just killing it at the smuggling game at 13. Exactly. <laughs> so, they do all run off to go see Reggie, and they're going to pitch it as copper and burnett and that they have a deal and i think what is that they need someone to smuggle their stuff for them right they're looking for someone to move it for them and they just walk <laughs> right up to dinner sit down and make the pitch right there and of course reggie's like hi stranger you want me to do what illegal thing for you he didn't go for it <laughs> yeah yeah it is just the weirdest way how many criminals just let strangers walk up to them and request them do criminal things. Like that does this. Don't you have to know a guy to know a guy? You can't. Not if it's like a public space. He just walks right up and He's says, like, "So you like drugs, huh?" <laughs> I got lots of and drugs. How is the Burnett and Cooper <laughs> aliases still working? They're not. That's the problem, as you can tell it later on in the scene. <laughs> He's like, "No, I don't want to do anything for you." <laughs> yeah, because it's real obvious that when Reggie hears these. Cooper and Burnett's pitch. He steps aside for just a minute to talk to his partner, who we all recognize immediately as Dr. Dingy. He's the one that was driving the ice cream truck. And so then when he comes back after talking to Dingy, he says, I don't want to do anything with you. Get out of here. I should kill you because you did some bad business with one of my friends. And that's what the duo talk about out on the street. That we recognized him as Dinky. 
they he recognized us as cops, but he didn't rat us out as cops. So what's the deal with that? But before they get as a chance, they leave the restaurant, they get hustled into two separate cars. Fifty dudes in cheap suits it is the. <laughs> <laughs> It, it, there's just so many dudes. Why do they need so many people to come wrangle them? They talk about the whole squad, John. They just left the club. Get the whole squad. I was gonna say it's like a bad version of that Robert, uh, that Robert Plant song where he's got the girls wearing the tuxedo mm-hmm. fancy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a cheap version of that. <laughs> Same yeah, suit. They, they barely fit the two cars. Like it was, it was uh... <laughs> a, like a van load, a bus load. Of guys in cheap suits come to get you. <laughs> So now they're going to get whisked away to go meet with this man named Stevens as the subtitles give away. <laughs> that, and Stevens is going to make this pitch to them. No, not Stevens, because we find out later that it's not Stevens that does the speech here. In the shadows, he's got light behind him, very ominous looking. Damn bright you light closed coming captioning, <laughs> lying to me. <laughs> very bright light coming from behind him standing the whole time with his hands on his hips duo are sitting in two chairs and suddenly immediately like who the hell are you and he goes on to tell them about we're not criminals we are tired of criminals getting back on the street here's a short slideshow of all the people <laughs> that have yes. gotten off because the criminal <laughs> justice system is so bad this is the most yes. dramatic sales pitch that's ever been done <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> so it's some kind shadows. of yeah, so it's some kind of cop secret society, and so like I'm already f- on the fence about whether or not t- Tubbs and Crockett are about to get paddled. <laughs> <laughs> and then they move on to the slideshow, which was very well presented. I, I they must practice this a lot. But dude, do you hear the crim- the stuff these criminals that they're talking about? Every guy is getting worse. This is Bob Smith. He raped 21 babies and <laughs> murdered 70 people. And he's off on a technicality. Like, Jesus. <laughs> he kicked like, 52 All kids. I learned from the slideshow is that Miami cops are terrible at their job. <laughs> yeah, I thought that too. I'm like, this is not a glory review for you guys. Clearly, you failed at arresting these people. <laughs> and then at the end of the slideshow, like his sales pitches, we've gotten pretty lucky and people like us. <laughs> Okay, but what happens if you say no? Like, you just let you go. <laughs> like You're like, no, I don't want to know anymore. Remember, because they're like, if you want to know more, come do this and whatever, and then we'll reveal our, our secret identities. But, okay, so, but what if I don't want to know more? Then how do I forget what I've seen? <laughs> 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 it was really weird. I mean, you're not going to go home and talk about that together. You and Tubbs be like, I don't know. What was with that guy in the shadows? <laughs> I, I feel Why like he I understand. Hands on his hips the whole time. <laughs> his hands were on his hips the entire time we were talking. Like, what are you trying to prove? <laughs> and Sonny's not buying I, it. I feel like the pitch is appropriate for them to pitch Sonny because I feel like Crockett kind of fits like being the leader of a vigilante group of cops at least in reputation (laughs) being a murderer Um, and (laughs) and in actions and in everything we've learned about his history but i don't feel like tubbs fits this pitch i don't understand why they took tubbs with him no i mean we already had an episode where they he faked it right and even then he had kind of a hard time faking it except for that bank teller she didn't stand a chance <laughs> yeah in this episode uh, uh, he is the, he's the weak link right because he's not believable <laughs> then he's going so he's yeah. like yeah i'm going along with this i'm really good at this evil thing and then there's tubs he's like yeah i don't know yeah. not really so sure he's like drawing plan. up plans for him this is how you're gonna rob this drug dealer <laughs> when at the end of this they say that you can find out more if you tell three friends and they tell <laughs> three more friends but it's not a pyramid scheme <laughs> It's more like a diamond. <laughs> and they try and hint, like, how do we find out who you are? Or it's kind of saying, like, what happens if we say no? It's like, well, then we just disappear and the lights go out. So that because they don't know who anyone is. But I'm still thinking it's weird. <laughs> they still know that they're cops, too. Yeah. So that means they can start investigating cops on the Miami-Dade police force. But they just don't know who that yes. guy is. They know who the guys who picked him up <laughs> the street are. They yes. were wearing bags over their heads when they picked them up. <laughs> They didn't have. Yeah, there's like they, 50 they, of them. They could pick out at least 10 of them. <laughs> they didn't have like not like the main guy. Yeah, the main guy. He was all like smoke and mirrors. But what about the 10 other guys that came in the bottom? <laughs> that limo ride. He's just sitting there <laughs> with all those it. guys yeah. in the limo, yes. crammed shoulder to shoulder like sardines inside of the can. Didn't identify any of them. <laughs> the most crowded limo ever. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, Reggie and Dinky have another deal that they have going on here. And that's where we go to see Escalante and Reggie and Dinky and Mano all go there to see, like, I don't know, like, what do you want? What, what do you want, Escalante? Not Mono, Tommy. Oh, Tommy. Yeah. Sorry. I think, I think Mono's dead. No, I'm yeah. saying. <laughs> and Escalante says, we need <laughs> guns and explosives. Can you provide that? And Richie says, yeah, of course. I can deliver it within 48 hours. Just give me a shopping list. And then when they walk away, Dinky and Tommy are like, what the hell are you talking about? We don't yeah, have access to any of this stuff. <laughs> He's like, no, I know you're going to find that stuff. That's your job. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, No, it's easy. We'll just steal the guns because that should be easy. Guns are easy to steal. <laughs> How would you like to have to be that bodyguard? He's probably worked for him for like five years, and he still has to reset a new golf ball on his tee every time he hits one. <laughs> so now the duo are going to see a demo, kind of like a, an example of what this vigilante team is able to do. So a limo pulls up, picks them up, and then takes them over to a canal where they watch this boat pull up and then rush in and like steal a bunch of stuff out of a warehouse uh, with no problems. There ends up being nothing wrong. And I think what the pitch here is, and Stevens... As he revealed himself. Yeah, (laughs) as he reveals himself later, what he's showing them is that because we're in on the inside, we know when things are going to happen. So we can do stuff instead of like arresting someone, we can just steal all the stuff that they're going to sell and then bust them later or something like that. Like we'll plant something else on, but we'll take all their stuff. They won't be able to provide it to anyone. So just it still just sounds like they're just stealing things from people, though. Like, <laughs> like who's to say they're well, really going to arrest you later on? <laughs> there's a lot of holes in their plan. One, I thought for sure, like with the bigger limo this time, it wasn't going to be near as cramped. But then you see like Tubbs is like right up against Crockett against the door. Clearly they brought another 15 guys to ride in there with them <laughs> as they're watching it they have a security guard at gunpoint while they're rob- the guys on the boat are robbing the place they don't kill the security guard but they could have easily killed the security guard since he's the only witness which more than likely could have happened you know and they're just sitting there watching it they can't intervene or anything which later in the episode comes up as a A problem. So the duo C, we have to be in on this because these vigilante cops are dangerous. They're doing dangerous things. Yeah, they're crazy. They agree. They're like, oh, yeah, we're in. This sounds great. And Stevens reveals himself. And then immediately they go over to the water tower and tell dad. Daddy. (laughs) (laughs) Daddy, the bad man. He took me in a limo. (laughs) (laughs) They're asking for us, asking dad for help. Like, tell us what what should we do here? There's I mean, there's a lot of them. It's just seen. There was like 30 people in a single limo. Like, there's a lot of them. What do we do here? And Castillo says, get inside as far as you can and just make sure no one gets hurt. But he says, though, that it's before he says that, he said, this, this is really dangerous. This makes me very nervous. I don't like this because somebody's going to get hurt. Foreshadowing. <laughs> <laughs> so now the duo are on the inside, and we're going to go over to where the vigilantes run their business. So this is their headquarters, their operations center. Dinky and Stevens are talking, and Dinky is going on about how he doesn't like helping these criminals. That he's stuck helping Reggie, being like his number two person, helping him buy explosives and guns and drugs and deal in these things. Stevens tries to tell him, just get over it, man. This is what we do. And Dinky says... What, why don't we just do stuff the right way? It's not too late to just book them. This is where we learn that Dinky is Johnny. And this is where I start to uh, I start to suspect that things aren't going to end well for Johnny. Crockett, he's really trying to sell he belongs there. So he feeds Johnny a bunch of bull. I'm sorry. It's probably true. He tells him about how 11 innocent people got killed because of this date, this guy. And that included a three-year-old and some stuff about some death squads in South America. But no one cares about them <laughs> also all those people in the everglades oh those yeah people deserve so, uh, it. that's what you get yeah. even in that crap town <laughs> we, we see that crockett's being a real team player johnny's not completely buying it or dinky or dr dinky or dr, <laughs> dr. Johnny, johnny dinky, dinky. <laughs> At the same time. <laughs> he goes outside and he goes, he's talking to Tubbs. Tubbs, he's not as much of a team player. He's, he's trying to fake it. Uh, and Johnny starts telling him, Johnny starts telling him about how his partner got blown away and how that changed his mind. And he joined with these bad cops and now they plant evidence and they get guys arrested. But he feels kind of bad when those guys get shanked in prison. At first, when he starts telling it, my, my, 
my thought was when his partner gets blown away, the guy gets off because they didn't have a warrant. My thought in my head's like, well, why, why did they have a warrant? Why were you guys there? And then once he gets the, yeah. And then by the time he gets to the end of his whole speech, asks Tug, so am I still a good cop? And I'm thinking, no, 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 you're a a terrible (laughs) cop. And that's when Steven goes to talk to Sonny. And that's when Stevens tells Sonny his story about how he got shot in the head. And ever since then, he's had this idea about running his own <laughs> yeah. vigilante team. Yes. <laughs> out. He got shot right in the brain. Yeah. And it made him depressed. I was, pre- I, yeah, I was a pretty good cop until I got shot in the face. <laughs> Things then, went downhill after that. And then I started having all these crazy ideas. <laughs> Dude, and then he starts going off. I saw my file. And can you believe it? They don't think I have any leader, no leadership skills. Well, look at me now, bitches. <laughs> <laughs> I'm running like a 50 man vigilante secret society. <laughs> you, me, the, the guy brain. that got shot in the face. <laughs> Steven says he was undercover for a while until he got shot in the head. That's when the voices started. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone else wonder how they can do their regular jobs when they have when they're doing all this vigilante stuff? Yeah. Like he says he works in systems analysis or something or whatever the analytical thing. Like, okay, well, when do you do that job? Because you've been doing <laughs> you've been at this like, house for weeks. <laughs> I mean, this, it's hard to disagree, like you're saying, John, with the little leadership potential. <laughs> After getting that the bullet brain. in the brain, he's kind of gone off a cliff. <laughs> I'm starting to get a major, like, fight club vibe here, these guys. <laughs> they have no idea that he thinks he's Tyler Durden. What is really interesting here is that this is extremely similar to an episode that we just had where Tubbs was locked in a prison in someone's basement because it was the same pitch. Aren't mm-hmm. you tired? of hardcore criminals getting off easy. Okay, let's take the justice into our own hands. Yeah, but that guy was just crazy because he was a criminal. He had gone around and murdered a bunch of people. He's just saying that because he just liked the Pope. (laughs) Yeah, that too. (laughs) That guy actually wrote a and and like story. made money. Hey, yeah, this guy, this was- guy all he did was get shot in the face and busted down the systems analysis. <laughs> hey, maybe the bullet would make him write a good book. <laughs> <laughs> I- I'm just saying, Pope guy's winning. <laughs> Ready for another Simpsons reference? Maybe he's got a blue crayon stuffed up in his brain. Okay, moving <laughs> along. Most interesting part here is that is Tubbs should be like, "Hey, bro, I heard this shit before. He's crazy." No, but Tubbs doesn't do that. Maybe he's got his own electric chair. I got to get out of here. I've already been through this <laughs> once. <laughs> because this has the same cult vibes so, that that guy had, too. Yeah, that's true. That is true. Yeah. You do not talk about, I don't know, what do they call themselves? The town car enthusiasts? <laughs> <laughs> so now the duo are going to go with Stevens to go watch a couple cops get shot and die. This is a very weird scene. I don't understand. Like, And I've seen it <laughs> several times. I still don't understand how much Stevens knew was going to happen. Like, did he know those cops were going to go door to door or was he just there to watch like the buy go down? Because yeah, what's happening here is that there's two cops in their police uniforms, which is against the law to go out and petition for voting for why well, you're. Yeah. So anyways, <laughs> moving hey, man, we, gotta play, we gotta pay for this policeman's ball somehow. <laughs> <laughs> They're passing out flyers to tell people to vote for Dicky for police captain stevens and the duo come pulling up and they're watching this place which they should know because tommy and dinky are inside there dr with- johnny dink md <laughs> 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 they're in there with dinky and reggie doing a deal to buy the plastic explosives so they're watching the place because they know that's where that deal is happening but they're also watching these two cops go door to door so when they knock and Tommy sees out the window that the cops are there, Reggie just runs out the front door, shoots both the cops, turns and shoots the dealer they're buying the plastic explosives from. They get in their car and leave. Sonny and Rico are in shock watching this while Stevens is like, yeah, now we know what's going to happen next. Yeah, he doesn't care they got shot at all. And Sonny wants to call for help. He's like, no, you can't use, we can't call for help because it'll give it away. And then, then yeah, he's and like, I, okay, I'll call as a citizen then. <laughs> and I feel like this is very preventable because we obviously saw these two poor cops coming. 
they were going door to door. So they could have caught them down the street somewhere and said, hey, hey, guys, we're doing a sting down here or something. No one knows. No one's going to check with their department heads. I just don't see why they just had to sit back and watch it when they like you. could, You had to know this was going to happen. They're inside buying plastic explosives and you're just watching these cops knock on the door. Also, what does Stevens need the information he gets out of this where he knows that they have the plastic explosives? Now, why does he need to know that? He's got two people embedded in the gang. He can, yeah. he'll, he'll know immediately when that happens, and he'll be able to know, like, okay, now that means that the deal is happening tonight. It's really got to be. He wanted to show Rico and Sonny how powerful he is, that he knows everything that's happening. Don't cross me because you never know where you're going to end up and how I'm going to be involved. In the next scene, we, we get to see the aftermath. We find out that those two poor cops were just two days from retirement. Or <laughs> They're always just two days from retirement. <laughs> Captain Highsmith shows up too. He's all mad because now no one's out campaigning for him. Exactly. They're going to win. I like how that was not brought up. Hey, they were out campaigning for you, jackass, because he's like all mad. And I can't believe you wouldn't tell me, Castillo. <laughs> yeah, Dick I mean, really he mad. comes back as the police chief in free fall. So apparently it worked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dickie's really mad because he's also knows Castillo says, I know that there are dirty cops. We have a bigger problem. Dickie's like, how come you didn't tell me about it? Castillo says, we're going to bring them all down tonight. And Dickie's like, okay, I'll see you there. No, he just says like, okay, oh, let no, me no. know how it goes. Like, he's not supposed to be there. Yeah. He was never supposed to be this, there. All right. The exact wording is very fun for phrasing. Dickie says, you better take it. Take it all. <laughs> <laughs> that was just, I lost it. I couldn't hold it. I was like, <laughs> like, oh, like I remember. <laughs> it's really funny. I'm writing that one down. <laughs> Back at Vigilante headquarters, Dinky is yelling at Stevens. Innocent cops got killed. He can't do it anymore. He's not going to do this any longer. He can't watch all these things happen. The duo are watching, very nervously watching. And Stevens finally agrees, says, you know, Dinky, you're right. Maybe this isn't for you. That's fine. You can go ahead and go. I understand. And when Dinky walks out, well, Tub's trying to talk him out of it. Like, no, you should stay. Like, something bad's going to happen. Night. Stay He's one like, more night when the bus goes down, and then we'll know that you'll be okay. Well, and it's weird, too, because he, like, he makes him pinky promise he won't tell. Like, that's going to do anything. <laughs> yeah, I knew uh, right and, then. I was like, oh, he's going to kill him. Then, <laughs> yeah, and there's like, okay, this is going to go bad for Johnny. Dr. Johnny Dinky drives <laughs> off, off, and Steven, you know, he goes into this tirade about how they need to recruit better as a van chases Johnny Dinky, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Johnny, uh, <laughs> as he drives away. <laughs> and Sonny and Stevens are able to hear faintly that gunshot too and you see the horror on Sonny Sonny is being ripped apart here because him and Tubbs see everything that's happening innocent cops get killed Dinky just got killed the power that Stevens has over this team the number of people that work at it it is out of control what are they going to do at this point basically like yeah. it this this vigilante group can't come down fast enough. Yeah, I mean, we're up to three dead cops at this point. So now we're going to go to the Escalante deal. This is when the vice team is going to bring down all of these dirty cops and Escalante and Reggie. I mean, this is very optimistic. <laughs> and they're going to... Hey, they got everybody involved. Here. They got the girls there watching from a window. <laughs> With no guns or anything. Watch I it. know. Big I was... Steve Austin with the cigar. He actually got <laughs> out from behind his desk. All of the groups are setting up in their different spots. So, like, we get to see, like, the drug guy and all of his guards walk in the tower and the, and the property and stuff. And then we see, like, Castillo and the girls and all the cops hiding around all the corners. And then we see Tubbs and Crockett with, like, 12 or 15 of the dirty cops. The guys in the cheap suits. That keep hustling and bustling them all over the place. <laughs> and they're like hiding in the bushes, like they're gonna jump out and grab them. And this is this is my favorite. So then the when the bus goes down, Tubbs and Crockett, just them, point their guns at the 15 guys with bigger guns than them next to them and order them onto the ground. And I'm thinking like, these two are severely outgunned right now. Yeah, the only like, advantage they, they have is that they're behind them. That's it. And somehow they are able to take all of them into custody before the mandatory gunfight breaks out. <laughs> they're able to take them into custody like they 
make them drop all their weapons with their hands over their head, march them all the way back to where the vice team is positioned, lock them up in, I don't know, the kitchen, the big refrigerator in the kitchen or something. <laughs> and then the shootout starts where one of, I think it's one of the vigilante cops that they didn't get. He like goes with Stevens. He just opens fire on Escalante's men. So then obviously Escalante's men fire back. And so now there's a three-way shootout between Vice with Stan leading the way, Escalante's men, yeah. and like a couple random vi vigilante cops that are there too. And, and man, this shootout, so we don't get to see very much the girls or the lieutenant. I don't think we see any of them shoot anybody. We, I think we maybe see Tubbs shoot his gun a couple times. Stan gets a couple of shots in, but really the shootout is Crockett going for the high score. Because he dominates the shootout as he makes his way through the facility, just whacking just guy after guy. Yeah, he shoots everybody. Tubbs busts in and gets Reggie and Escalante. He has them. So he locks down that room. And then Sonny just goes on duck hunt. He's just picking people off left and right. Yes. He finally catches up to Stevens, who's at a car. And he he's not there at all trying to uh, like bring in Reggie or anything like that. He's stealing a bunch of coke. And he tells Sonny... We use this to fund the our campaign, our vigilante group. We use these drugs to fund it. So I'm taking it right now. And uh, hey, you want to help me out? So he says, no, you're under arrest. And Steven says, uh, come on, Sonny. I mean, we all know we're ready to make a deal. I know way more about this group that you'll want to know, including it going all the way to the top of the top. And that's when Dickie pokes his head around the corner. And you start to put it together like, why is Dickie there? And Dickie hears Stevens making this pitch. I know a lot of information about how high this goes. He turns, fires at Stevens, shoots and kills him. Sonny's just in shock, flips around. I can't, what did you do? Dickie says, I'm here to protect you. You are in danger. This is how you thank me? This is how you say thanks for me saving your life? And then he just walks he away. Just walks away. <laughs> and at the same yeah. time, the <laughs> same music is playing. That happened when there was the introduction to the vigilante group. And that's when it dawns on Sonny. That's why I recognize that voice is because the voice that was at the vigilante introduction is Dickie. It's the same person. It blows me away with one that obviously it's the same voice. And two, that he just flats out shoots him in cold blood. It is the most obvious cover up ever. As soon as he starts to say, I can give you all these names, he just pops out around the corner and goes, bam. No, you won't. <laughs> <laughs> Sonny's in shock. He can't believe what he saw. And there's almost nothing that he can do about it because we go to the last scene of the episode and Sonny is watching Dickie on TV. And he's talking about how he led a bust on drugs and guns earlier that day, which is what he told Castillo. He wants, that's the type of police chief he wants to be that he's on bus every once in a while and he wants all of his managers basically to be to do that as well and he closes with i'm gonna do whatever it takes and Sonny turns off the tv whatever it takes so now we know the next chief of police is a dirty cop and if you're gonna end the show and i'm sure everyone who's listening to this podcast has watched Miami vice before so you guys know where this is going but me and John have never seen it before. But now it's obvious. Miami Vice loves to do dirty cop stories. How do you end with a dirty cop story? You end with the dirtiest cop. And that is also the number one cop on the police force. Also, did we mention that we saw that this actor appears in Freefall. And it's also the same writer and director <laughs> as <Also>. Freefall. <laughs> this was such a classic episode of Vice. It hit all the notes that felt so familiar. But I want to give away all my final thoughts here. I mean, it was it even at Izzy. The only thing, the only way this could have gotten any more perfect is A, if Zito appeared, oh. and B, if the Nook Man made an appearance too. No. <laughs> <laughs> We're good. Zito, but no, no Nook Man. Maybe if they let the ladies do something other than stand behind Castillo. <laughs> true. <laughs> I want to know. I'd love to know the st true story behind, like, why they didn't write them any. Yeah, I know. What do you think the real reason was for that? There's got to be something why they didn't give them anything in the in the show. Why they? I don't know. Yeah, there's yeah, it makes no sense. And I mean, it, it's not like there weren't other shows around, other cop shows that were popular that had female characters. Well, before we give away too much of our final thoughts, let's go take a look at this week's music. It's um again like one of those things that you expect out of Miami Vice, but a little less than normal. Let's go take a look at this week's music. All right, John, as you know, I do a companion show called This Week in Vice. And for this week's episode, there's actually four number ones that happened in between the last 
episode, and one of them is from Mike and the Mechanics. And so I figured this is just a slam dunk for Mike and the Mechanics to appear in this week's music. What do you got for us this week? Not Mike and the Mechanics. <laughs> <laughs> this week we get one band and one band only, The Fix, with their song, I'm Life. Now, this isn't the first time that we have heard the music of The Fix in the show. Their music also appeared in the episode, The Tale of the Goat could possibly be before i started my music segment so we're gonna really touch on them we're gonna go we're just gonna go do a full dive on them the fix is a british rock and new wave band formed in london in 1979 their biggest hits are songs one thing leads to another which is probably the song you got we, we would all know other hits saved by zero we are ourselves and secret separation all of which made the u.s top 20 as well as uh, some mtv video hits with their songs red skies and uh standard fall but they were pretty pretty popular they were hitting the charts they were uh getting regular rotation on mtv at the time they were originally formed by college friends Cy kernan on vocals and drummer adam woods they were originally called the band was originally called the portraits they would place an ad and they would add keyboardist rupert greenell guitarist tony mcgrail and bassist russell mckenzie but mckenzie would almost would be replaced almost immediately by charlie barrett they would only release two singles before they he would be replaced and then guitarist tony mcgrail would be replaced by guitarist James West Aura, formerly of the Philip Rambos band. And at that point is when they would change their name to The Fix. And pretty quickly change their name from The Fix with one X to The Fix with two X's. Because the record label thought that one X would associate them with drugs. But two X's... <laughs> <laughs> Two X's, not associate them with drugs. The difference maker. So their MCA RCA period was from 82 to 91. They saw a ton of success in the United States and Canada, but they also went through bassists like Spinal Tap went through drummers. <laughs> Their song Deeper and Deeper would show up on the soundtrack for the 84 film Streets of Fire. Their 84 album Reach the Beach would be their most commercial success, commercially successful album. Curran and West Orem would do stuff like play tracks for Tina Turner's album, 84 album Private Dancer. For big time, the 80s. Their 85 song A Letter to Both Sides would be made specifically for the film Fletch. That's big, guys. Fletch was a big film in the 80s. <laughs> Number one during this time period was also the sequel, Fletch Lives. One of the more unnecessary sequels of the 80s. That, that was after Fletch Lives that people were like, okay, we've kind of had enough of uh, Chevy Chase. <laughs> they would do uh, release four more albums throughout the 80s into the 90s with a ton of success. By 92, they were pretty established. They would actually move. This would be their... Post major label era, they released with a bunch of different other smaller record labels. And as we know, they would instantly replace their bassists. In 94, bassist Dan K. Brown would leave the band and they just, they would replace them. Instead, they would just use session musicians. And then Chris Date, who was in the band, I believe, as the guitarist, would also play bass on most recordings. And during some of the live shows from 95 to the early 2000s. Yeah, they were like, screw it. We're, we're done auditioning <laughs> bassists. We're, we're just going to hire a guy for every city. <laughs> during this era in the early 2000s that they would cover Nancy Sinatra's These Boots Are Made For Walking for the cover album When Pigs Fly, which uh, actually that's a pretty big, that was a pretty big album. And then in 2003, they would bring in Gary Tibbs, formerly of bands the Roxy Music, The Vibrators, and Adam of the <laughs> Ant. Adam and the Ants. <laughs> and Tibbs would play bass for their ninth studio album, Want That Life. Then in 2008, Dan K. Brown would return, which would bring together one of the original lineups, or basically back to their pre-90s, one of their pre-90s lineups, as a celebration for their 25th year as a band they would release a double anthology and in 2012 release their 10th studio album with the classic lineup in place with their classic lineup in place the album known as beautiful friction 
So, and I guess they still regularly tour all, all the way around, uh, all around the world. So, like, the fix is still, still out there doing it, man. Still making the dream happen. I hear they're big in Australia. <laughs> And uh, there's your music. Everybody go out and look up the vibrators. <laughs> I don't know. I'm starting to hear all these bands. starting to feel like I have a shot at making bass. <laughs> okay, well, let's go give our final thoughts on this episode. Uh, I'm interested to see where everyone stands because I've kind of, you know, I've kind of planted my flag as I do throughout the breakdown. I'm interested to see where everyone else is at. Let's go give our final thoughts on this one. Melissa, what are your final thoughts on this episode? Set our baseline here. Someone who knows what's coming in the future. What are your thoughts on this episode? I love this episode. It's it's a great episode. Uh, like you said, it goes back to the original Vice that we all love so much. It They try to pull it in at the end to give you a little bit of nostalgia, I think, of what's going to happen. I don't like what it sets up, <laughs> we'll say, for the future. <laughs> but I do like this episode. I think I think the, the only thing that always throws me off is that I said several times is that I think Tubbs looks like he's way younger. It has the aging backwards in this episode. <laughs> he looks so young. Um, it's, it's got the funny part. It's got Izzy. How could you not love it? It's got Izzy. I know it's the crooked cop or the vigilante cop story which we've had several of those, but it's still, I think they did a, a good job and they did it in a different way and they made it so that it stands out as far as all those other stories go. I mean, we did laugh at the secret society in the, in the, of, in the darkness when they gave their PowerPoint. <laughs> but other than that, I think it's a good episode and th- you're going to see that it's all going to tie together. It's just one big step towards the end. John, what are your final thoughts? I really liked it. I thought you hit it on the head with it being very, uh, and, and I think that's been a trend in these last few episodes. We've this isn't the first episode that we've said feels more like season two, season three, and, and so. And I thought it was a good episode all the way through. We even got a little more visual participation from the rest of the squad. We even met people in the squad we we didn't even know, but, uh, <laughs> like they were at least present. During the times of the episode, they may not have been talking, but they were there. Like Cigar Man. So, yeah. Ultimately, it was a good episode. I wish the music and guest stories were a little bit better for my segments, but you know, that that's here and there. I get it. We're getting towards the end, toning it down. This is a good episode. It's a good story arc. It's one of the better dirty cop episodes that we've been given. And we get Izzy. So, I mean, what what's not to like? <laughs> Throughout this episode, I kept thinking like, hey, you know, this all feels really familiar. Like, yeah, okay, it's some dirty cops. And okay, we've kind of seen this story before. This is a lot like the episode that we just had where the, we had someone who wanted to take justice into their own hands. Uh, but this, man, this feels so comfortable. Like a like a car I've ridden in, you know, like <laughs> your, your toilet at your house. <laughs> it just feels comfortable, familiar. And then we got to the end, and we saw Dicky there, and I didn't put it together at first. I saw him standing there, and then he turns and shoots. And I'm like, that's interesting. Like it was one of the vigilantes. Oh my god, it's the chief of police, <laughs> and it just hit me like a uh-huh. ton of brick. And he's gonna reappear. And the director and the writer, so for the same episode of Freefall, oh my god, I'm starting to put together like where the direction that this show is going to go in. And it has to be very familiar for the people who, that were watching it when it came out. So not saying that you know like the director and the writer that they're going to work on the last episode of the season or whatever. But you don't end an episode with a cliffhanger knowing that there's only two episodes to go. Obviously, exactly. that cliffhanger is going to be resolved in the next two episodes. Yep. So, yes. This hit so many chords for me that just were perfect and showed like why Vice was was the best cop show on in the 80s and set the standard for cop shows going forward. It hit all the notes. It was funny. It was self-aware. It was serious when it had to be. It had a surprise twist at the end. Music, okay, yeah, it's not the same as what music was in earlier seasons, but we still had, you know, a very, very popular band as music. And and to give Tim Truman some credit, it felt like there was more music in the episode than just one song. Exactly, exactly. So this was such a great episode of Vice. It's probably one of the best ones we've had in season five, especially, like, uh, for sure, one that we've had in a long time. And now, now I'm getting the opposite effect. Before, I was like, okay, I can't wait to get to the season finale or the series finale. And now I'm like, wait, the show's getting good. Like, Can we stretch this out a little bit more? Can we delay uh-huh. this a little bit? Don't worry. You'll change your mind when you watch some of those Loft episodes. 
<laughs> be like, maybe they did the right thing by not showing me. <laughs> I take it all back. Let's go back to be shortened. <laughs> and that's going to do it for us this week on Go With The Heat. We would love to hear from you. Email us, heat at gmail.com. Let us know where you stand on this episode. We definitely want to hear it because, like we're saying, there's so much that leads into free fall with this episode. We want to hear your thoughts on this episode. Not necessarily what's going to happen in free fall, but what you think the effects are of this episode and anything that ties into it. Because, as I know, Izzy will come back in free fall. It is no mistake that Izzy makes a small appearance in this episode. Everything just fits perfectly together. We would love to hear from you. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. Check out that website, go with the heat.com. You can find all the ways to contact us, all the ways to subscribe, all the ways to support us. Support step number one go to that Patreon, sign up, pledge $1. Get that one, pay us that $1 on February 1st. We will send you some stickers. I would be happy to send them out before the show comes to an end, knowing that there are people out there that love to go with the heat have some of our stickers, threw them on some things, and just extend the life of the show. That could make us so happy if you were to do that. So support step number two, go to your podcast, your platform of choice, leave us a review. Give us five stars, four penguins, five triangles, whatever the hell their rating system is. <laughs> write a review, but don't write a review about the podcast. No one ever reads those things except for me, apparently. <laughs> Instead, <laughs> write in there what would happen if Dr. Dinky actually survived and continued his ice cream ways. <laughs> what would Dr. Dinky be doing right now? <laughs> Support step number three, email us, goldie at gmail.com. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pals.